All right, welcome everybody to the second episode of Today's Collector, a series leading up to the Mint Collective at the end of January in Las Vegas. My name is Jeremy Lee. I'm the host of Sports Cards Live. Let's bring on today's guest. Here he is, Nat Turner. How you doing? Hey, doing well. Good, Matt. Well, listen, I wanted to bring you on to today's collector because you built an impressive collection. I've seen glimpses of it on your Instagram page, and I think you can offer the audience some insights into curating a unique and personal collection. But let's start quickly with how did you get started in the hobby? Yeah, um, I was given this card. <laughs> I have it at the top. Yeah, uh, last card in the set. Hank Aaron. Um I got into baseball cards uh, with my dad back in the early 90s. Uh, Griffey, Nolan Ryan, all the end of his career, a uh, bunch of the Braves, and uh, just started collecting uh, sets. Uh, when I tried to complete uh, various sets as a kid. I got into basketball around 96, uh, Kobe Bryant's rookie year, which was really exciting. Jordan came back uh, the year before. It was just a lot going on in basketball. I was a Rockets fan too. I was in Houston. We won two championships right before that. Um, so I got into basketball cards and I just started collecting. I didn't have, we didn't have a ton of resources to buy, you know, the high impacts like flair showcase and EX and stuff. So I maybe had a few of those, but I was mainly hunting inserts, you know, an upper deck and metal and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. That's how I got into it. All right, good. So, you know, one of the one of the things that I always think about the hobby is that, and one of the reasons I love going to card shows and talking to people is because I always ask people, how do you approach the hobby? You know, what's your angle? And it really comes down to, I believe, you know, recently there's two approaches uh, that really stand out to me. One is the old buy what you love, collect what you like versus the I'm in it to invest. So I want to ask you, how do you approach the hobby with those approaches in mind? Um, I'm probably mostly, you know, collecting what I like. Uh, I think, you know, there's been three or four times where I've said, you know, this would be a good investment and I buy the card. Like a good example would be Mahomes. Um, maybe another good example would be with Luca, uh, recently, but you know, mostly like when I buy Jordan cards or LeBron cards, it's because I like the, those players. Um, you know, I'm not a super fan of Mahomes or Luca per se yet. So the, I, I, those are probably more in the investment camp. But, you know, my strategy lately is just, well, not lately, in the last five years or so is to do sets. Um, you know, I'm really into, uh, I think most set collectors are vintage. Like, you know, they do baseball, basketball, football, even hockey, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And that's great. There aren't enough set collectors in the 70s, 80s. 90s and even 2000s um 70s there are some but you know the most of the modern and ultra modern folks i know are just you know collecting big inserts and you know building player collections they think are good investments so you know i i, I was telling you before we started recording now i'm going through you know i'm doing the set of 96 top scrum refractor because i just think it's an awesome it's top scrum refractors like what's not to love kobe's yeah. rookie year but you know there's only like four or five people going after that set um on the PSA set registry. So that's that's kind of what I do. I really I go after the sets I love, you know, Star Rubies, Metal. Um, you know, I'm doing metal base set from 97. You know, those packs were three dollars. You can buy commons on eBay, you know, by the dozens for like five bucks. I mean, it's just that's a probably the most beautifully designed set ever in my opinion. Um so yeah, mostly what I love. So you're mostly collect what you like kind of kind of collector. Yeah, it ma makes sense. I think you, I think we need some of that to keep ourselves passionate and interested in in the cards themselves. So believe it or not, Nat, you had a you had a pretty big impact on my collecting approach and outlook when you acquired your PMG green, your precious metals, precious metal gems green, Michael Jordan. I believe it was in around 2019. You bought it at on an online uh, an eBay auction. And I saw you interviewed after and you said that you know, it wasn't about the condition of the card. You almost didn't even really care about the condition of the card. All that mattered to you was owning a copy of that card. Can you speak to that? Because as I mentioned, it had an impact on me where I realized, you know, you, you don't need to wait around or I don't no longer, do I need to wait around for the perfect copy of a card, especially a rare card? It's simply about just owning the card itself. Can you speak to that and how you got there in your own approach? 
Yeah. Um, so for certain cards, I really don't think it matters. You know, I think the rarer the card, you know, usually the serial numbered ones, um, you know, the whether it's a seven, eight, nine, ten, like shouldn't matter. I mean, it, it's you know, ninety eight percent of of it is the card itself. How rare the card is, the rarity, the scarcity of it. Um, you really and you really can't be picky, honestly, if you're searching for one of those rare cards. You know, good examples are the PMG uh, greens and reds, the PMGs from 98 as well, and championship from 97. I'd say gold prisms from 2012. You know, there's only 10 of each of those. You shouldn't care. Uh, I mean, people do, but I'm, I'm advocating that, you know, like a LeBron gold prism from 2012, like that's such an iconic rare card. You know, who cares if it's an 8, 9, or 10? Um, but you know, look, if you're talking 86 Claire Jordan or you're talking the 03 tops from LeBron, it actually really does matter. Uh, it's just the I think it's the population of the card, the print run of the card. Um, you know, I, I kind of think it's a little uh frankly, uh it's it's actually worse if the card's in really high grade for a rare card because you start to wonder why. Um, you know, like a PMG Green Jordan 10 probably shouldn't exist, you know, because you know they were pulled back then and handled so much, they're such a popular card. You kind of hope that there's wear and tear on some of those really rare cards. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I approach it. It's very much dependent on the card. Yeah, I, that makes perfect sense to me. I think I think the perfect grade for a precious metal gems, green or red, is like a six or a seven. Mm. That's that's the seven. sweet spot. <laughs> seven. That's where you want it to be, right? Any higher, like you said, you question. Any lower, and you think, ah, I'd rather it be a six or a seven. So, And I also completely agree that the lower the print run, the less important the condition is and and also the more important the card is or the set is to the overall mm -hmm. hobby again the less important it is to get in a certain condition but when it comes to commodity card conditions everything at the end of the day for a card that is you know that you can go on ebay at any time and find a couple hundred copies like a 86 michael jordan rookie or a 79 wayne gretzky rookie so i, I definitely definitely agree with you on those comments Let's talk about building a collection and how do you go about it? How do you go about sourcing or locating a card that you just can't find regularly on the public auction houses? Um, it's a multi-pronged approach. So, you know, I'm on eBay a lot. I'm on pretty much every auction site a lot. Um, auction house a lot. I'm every one of them, especially for vintage baseball. That stuff doesn't really end up on eBay very often. Um, so you got to go to memory lane. You got to go to REA because ending the night, you got to go to a bunch of places, golden sports for, for vintage. Um, so yeah, auction houses, eBay, and then the other auction sites. Um, I do a lot of kind of Instagram DMing, uh, a lot of forum direct messages, like blow up, um, a lot of emails where, you know, I've got longstanding relationships with, you know, 30, 40 collectors around the world. Uh, you know, when certain cards they come across or I come across, you know, we're always trading information, you know, what cards are in my duplicates folder as a good example. Uh, three or four of those people in particular, like Grant Slayton's a good friend of mine in the hobby, a good example. He and I talk almost every day discussing what we're looking for. Um, it's just a lot of different uh, strategies. Um, you know, honestly, at this point, I'm really lucky. I get a lot of people who just reach out to me you know, usually through Instagram, uh, where I don't see it maybe for a few days because it doesn't show up. I have to click on requests and see maybe because I don't follow them yet. Um, like, for example, I, a guy reached out and his dad pulled a 98 Michael Jordan Rubies from Skybox, had it raw for the last 24 years, uh, 23 years. And thank God I looked at my DMs that day. <laughs> um, but yeah, I paid a full price for it, but the, locating the card was so cool you know, with a story like that. Same thing, uh, a 97 game Jersey auto, Michael Jordan, I, I found through direct messages on Instagram. A guy reached out, had it in a safety deposit box for like 24 years. Um, so yeah, just things like that. And just the higher profile you are, uh, in the hobby in many ways allows you people reach out when they don't have, when they don't know what they have. And by the way, you can see a lot of junk, but as long as you're patient, you know, there's diamonds in the rough for sure. So I think the lesson for a collector or someone coming in who is not as high profile as you are is to constantly look at all the different platforms out there as you also do and 
would you say that building up a, a profile on Instagram is is key to locating cards, right? And I know you mentioned for yourself, but again, people reach out to you. For someone who people don't reach out to directly, how important is it to have a, an Instagram page these days in the hobby? I think it's critical. I mean, I remember when I joined, I was pretty reluctant because I was part of that generation of like Flickr plus Blowout and Hobby Kings where that kind of felt like, you know, enough. And I joined a little after probably I should have. And once I got on there, I was like, oh my, this is the perfect medium and platform for card sharing and, and deal making. I think if you're interested in building a collection, you, you kind of have to be on Instagram at this point. Hard and, not to, unless you're vintage. Vintage guys aren't on there yet. Yeah, yeah. not as much at least for sure. Yeah. Speak a little bit towards the importance of relationships in the hobby, not only for sourcing cards, but, you know, in, like, for example, if someone reaches out to you on Instagram and says, hey, I have this card, I want, you know, $10,000 for it. You're like, well, I'm not just sending anybody $10,000. How do you, as a potential party to the transaction, how do you vet that person? And what would you recommend people like that do so that they can be vetted? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of signals you have to look at. You have to look at um, number of followers on Instagram, eBay feedback, if they have an eBay account, you need to ask people uh, that you trust had they done deals with that person. And that's kind of the, the first step. And then the second step is I do this a lot is I use what I just call intermediaries or escrows. So ship my cards or com C, you know, you can actually leverage, um, you know, in that way, you can also use folks like golden to um, take receipts of the card uh, from the person and then pay once they have receipts of the card you know, a trusted third party in the middle. Um, a lot of auction houses will do that, not just golden, you know, if it's a high end card for sure. Um, but frankly, you have to take some risks. Like, you know, I've certainly had situations where someone's like, I'm not comfortable sending it to anywhere, but you, and you have to pay first and you kind of just have to gamble. Um, I I'm lucky. I haven't been burned that much. Um, lately I've been burned many times in the past. I've definitely gotten more cautious. Um, so yeah, I do the escrow thing a lot where I send it, I have them send it to someone else first and then I pay after they receive it. Yeah, that's, a, so that's, that's certainly a great option. And just speak a little bit to, again, just the importance of relationships and building mm -hmm. them and, uh, you know, expanding your network and the hobby through things like Instagram and even going to shows and meeting people in person. How do you feel that, how do you feel those tactics would benefit someone who's coming to the hobby and looking to build out a collection? Yeah, I mean, look, you can do a lot without going to shows. Shows makes it even better because you get to meet the people face to face and the relationships get better. But yeah, I mean, look, over the last, um, since 03, when I've, I've really been bigger into cards, I mean, and there's five or six people I can think of that really stand out that, you know, many of the major items I needed, and not necessarily high end, but, you know, PMG Greens or whatever it is, you know, have come from that group of folks, that small group of people who look out for me and what I'm interested in. And they have things they're interested in and I'm always in the lookout as well. It's a, it's a really nice symbiotic type of thing. Um, but that's kind of the key. It's, you know, have folks that you have like, uh, you know, mutual interest in helping each other. Um, meeting in person at shows makes it, you know, whatever, five times as effective and, and frankly fun. Um, but you know, you certainly don't have to, um, you know, a number of people I've engaged with in the hobby, I only met maybe 10 years later. Yeah. Um, so, Actually, you know, it's funny, just real quick. So two of our uh, product managers at Collectors at PSA, I met on the forums, one of them in 04 through eBay, through eBay messages, and then another through, uh, through I think, Blowout back like 10 years ago, both of whom now are full-time employees at, at PSA. Just funny how the world works. So those relationships, you know, you lead, lead can lead to... to you know, things other than just helping find cards for each other. <laughs> well, that's a cool story. But let me let me just clarify. So these two individuals who work for collectors now, did they start working there since you came on board and you kind of hired them because you knew them through those relationships yeah, that began right. back 15 years ago? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were, when, when, when I bought the company in February, they reached out. I mean, I was really good friends with one of them and then the other I'd known just through messages. One I'd met before in person, the first person. And yeah, both. I was like, hey, you know, if I could convince you to leave your job and come join here, you know, call me back. And 
both did and it took a couple months on one of them but yeah they're both full-time one's our chief product officer ryan yeah. awesome well it took a while but you got them yeah no well i think 10 year 10 year interview process <laughs> yeah I, I think the I think the lesson there, you know, to people who are watching this, who are looking to again, kind of step into the hobby or or grow within the hobby and build out a great collection, is that you never know who you're communicating with at the other end of a an eBay message, let's say, and it's I think it's good practice just to always be respectful, treat people the way you want to be treated. It comes back to relationships, building a network. And you just never know how that could come to benefit you down down the line, even in terms mm -hmm. of employment with yeah. one of the you know major companies in the space. Does that all make sense to you? Yeah, that's right. Let's uh, let's switch it up a little bit. In the hobby, as collectors, we often covet very special cards, and we refer to them as grails. We always talk. We well, we people who talk to each other, we talk to each other in the hobby about grails and. You, you know, I might be selling, someone will say to you, why are you selling these cards? Are you search, Are you hunting a grail? Are you saving up for a grail? Can you define to you uh, what the what a grail means? What is a grail in terms of uh, the aspect of a card itself and price point? Um, I think a lot of people, with, you know, want to say grails are extremely valuable. Um they don't have to be like one of my grails is like a Robert Pack PMG Green. I mean, you know, that card's probably, I mean, it's worth a lot since I and me, myself, and like one other person really want it, but it's, you know, truthfully not, you know, a whale by most people's financial standards. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, you know, I can think of five or six cards. It's cards that I think are probably by definition going to be hard to find. Uh, you know, either scarce or for some reason someone, you know, has, has hoarded them, which, you know, there are some examples of that I'm thinking of. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it'll likely be very hard to get. So like in my case, oh, it could be very expensive. Um, so for example, in my top five, you know, there's a few cards that are pretty small, like there's three PMG greens that I've never seen. Um, you know, I need eight more of them. Five of them exist. I've seen copies of them, but three I have not. So, you know, I'd throw I'd throw that into the mix. Brian Grant, Robert Pack, and Del Curry, if you're wondering. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, you know, those are pretty low, low end, but then I'd argue for me it'd be like, you know, this is gonna sound ridiculous, but you know, PSA 10 mantle 52 tops. Like that's clearly a grail by every standard. Um, financially scarce, scarcity, everything. Um so it just depends on what you need for your collection purposes and what you think is going to be hard to find. Um, what's your what's your per, your perception on the average value out there of a grail? Like, you know, yeah, the average collector's grail value. Like, you know, I had a conversation on the first episode of today's collector with Josh Dawson, and we kind of settled on twenty five thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand that's a it's a big that range sounds, right no i was i was gonna say 25 to 50 grand is probably the average for most people yeah the grail I, but i mean look is today's the 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 hobby has grown so much and prices have risen i mean yeah i mean i i'm sure it can be much higher depending on the person yeah yesterday's twenty five thousand is today's two hundred and fifty thousand in a, in yeah, a lot of cases think crazy well, and you're right yeah continuing on this grail uh this grail discussion how often does a does a card or how 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 in often does a card have to show up on say ebay to be considered a grail like very infrequently if ever <laughs> like once every once a year once every five oh, every, years. every like five to ten years so yeah. so like one of mine is the ex future lebron one of one like that was, that's been on ebay once in 15 years um that's a I don't grail. know, grails have to be i mean you've watched Monty python was the was the holy grail hard to find it's gotta, it's gotta be it's gotta be hard to find <laughs> you know yeah, yeah i think so and I, I think just like with the word goat that we use in the hobby we use it we use the term grail a lot more loosely now than we used to just like we use the term goat a lot more loosely no, it needs to be a mythical like the white whale you know the right. card you'll, you may never get that's what it's supposed to be. That's what it's supposed to be. All right. Bit of information about your collection itself, like the breadth of your collection. 
simple question. How many cards would you say are in your personal collection that you actually care about? Um, those are probably the ones that are graded. I mean, I have a lot of raw cards, but you know, mostly commons and set filler stuff uh, that I'll grade one day. But, you know, I just looked since you asked me earlier, I've got uh, about 13,000 PSA slabs. Um, I've got about 8,000 Beckett slabs. Um, and I've got a lot of boxes and packs like this kind of stuff. Um, oh. So I've got probably over a thousand boxes um, and cases and packs and all sorts of things. Well over a thousand. And you so, tend to actually open your uh, your wax, your sealed wax every so often. And you'll do a post on Instagram and kind of show the hits and the box itself. And what I love about what you post is you actually turn the box over and you show all the pack odds and the, the, the fine print, uh, speak a bit to that and, and why you enjoy that so much. Yeah. Well, a lot of it, you know, I don't even notice, uh, collection wise, like I've got so many bot, not to be obnoxious, but you know, you have so many boxes, like if you open one or two every now and then it doesn't even make a difference. So it's actually kind of nice. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt, you know, like you have, like, for example, I have I'm looking at them like 15, uh, series one metal 97s, maybe a little more than that. So I opened one the other day, like no big deal. You know, I wouldn't open, say, I have uh, two 9060X boxes. Like I'm not going to open one of those because I only have two of them. Um, but, you know, for for usually it's boxes that have ripped uh, shrink wrap uh, or are, you know, unsightly. You know, like they've been discolored or smell like, like cigarette smoke or um, something that just, you know, they don't look great. I like to display my boxes. I've got them kind of all around me right now. And so like the 96 top scrum I opened, like it looked like it had fallen off the UPS truck like eight times. So I just open the boxes like that. Uh, every now and then I'll pick one out. Like if I'm usually after like a glass of wine or beer, I'll, I'll, you know, get lose self-control and open a box. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how, how it goes. It's fun. I mean, I, I frankly couldn't, I don't think I uh, would trying to think, I don't remember a single instance of being able to afford and buy a whole box of cards you know, until I was maybe uh, in college, right? Mm -hmm. So part of it is like, I can't believe I'm opening a box of metal right now. I used to buy like a pack or two. Um, so that's kind of maybe something like, I don't know, nostalgic slash revengeful. I don't know what the right word is, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. <laughs> well, you're, you're looking up at your box as a 97 metal universe and you also have three cards that you've never seen ever. I know, I know, I know. Like, how have you not just ripped into those thinking maybe, I mean, I know the odds are so slim, but don't you wonder? Well, that's why I haven't is the odds are so slim. I mean, I know the guy who pulled the, there, I think it was 15, 2015 or 16. He pulled a green Jordan and a guy like two, a uh, few months ago pulled a uh, green mesh, like not so long ago. Um, every box I've opened has been no PMGs. I've opened Actually, I've only opened one recently, and there was no PMG. I've opened a bunch of championship and 98 metal, and I've gotten – I actually pulled a Tom Gugliotta PMG out of the 98, um, which was nice, um, the one out of 50. Um, so that was a good card to pull. Yeah, but it's yeah. been it's been tough. Like, I don't want to open boxes. I know, you know the odds are low. So I don't, I don't blame you. It's definitely a gamble. But uh, but I mean, when you're down to three cards that you've never seen, I know. I'll, I'll bust them at some point. Over time, over time, you want to savor that, right? You want to savor that. Well, I was at the national and I was in the grading room, and two of the PMG greens I had never seen were submitted. So there were five that I had never seen before the national, and two of them showed up. I, I was able to acquire one of them; the other one's still out there. Oh, you weren't really, but you were, so you found, you saw who submitted it and you actually, I actually knew the that. guy. Yeah. Oh, I knew that, who it was. Yeah. That helps. That helps. For I sure. don't know. I didn't know the other guy. I didn't even reach out to him. I just, I knew someone who knew him and I haven't been able to get it. But maybe There's next time. national, the three will show up. You never know. You never know. You never know. Uh, what sports do you collect and, and what players do you focus on? You mentioned LeBron and MJ earlier. Is it just LeBron and MJ and uh, is it just basketball or can you expand on that? Uh, I, it's pretty, it's pretty wide. So I do baseball, uh, vintage really from 52, a little bit of 51 through, I would say 75. Uh, and then I skip a lot of years until Griffey, uh, 
and Jeter in the 90s. And then I pick it back up with Trout in 2009. And then a little bit of Acuna and Shohei. So that's baseball. And then I do packs based in boxes from 52 through 79. Uh, and then, although a couple other ones, like I've got a 93 SP case, you know, Jeter rookie year is an example. Basketball, I do, I don't do a lot of vintage. That's although I, I feel like I'm going to get into it soon. Um, it's really 90s and a little bit of 80s uh, and then a lot of 03 um, So because of LeBron. So I do exquisites and I, I want one of every LeBron card, including parallels from 03, which I'm pretty close to having done. Um, but yeah, 90s, it's it's rare sets. It's Kobe, it's Jordan. Um, and then, yeah, well, I collect masterpieces. Just It could be Bryant Reeves. I don't care. I just think they're so cool. Uh, football, I do. Oh, and yeah, basketball boxes basically every year. Uh, until 03, a um, lot of 90s boxes. And then football, no, not a lot of singles. I do a lot of Brady, but that's it. I only have like 100 football cards. Um, although I am getting into the PMG reds and greens for 97 mm -hmm. football. Um, nice. And then hockey, I got a lot of packs and boxes, but I only have like two or three singles. Well, we'll work on that, right? We'll work <laughs> on that. My yeah, son in hockey. He's a big I, hockey card fan. So. I'm glad to hear. Well, let, let's, uh, if you ever need any advice on which hockey cards to buy, you can always uh, he, just get this. Is I, uh, We bought a few packs of metal at uh, the show. He bought, he pulled a PMG red. Oh, no way. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. How often do you buy singles for your collection? Like, like what, what is it? How many bubblers do you get to the, to the house every week or so? Um, it's probably five to 10 per day. I mean, it's a lot. I, I I'm buying a lot. I mean, it's a lot of loan stuff. I'm buying like two to $20 singles. Like, but I just bought like a bunch of these, for example, these are like $20 a piece, like 52. Um, it's an 05 tops, 1952 style Chrome gold refractors. I mean, there's, I basically have a hit out on any of those at like $50 and under. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I bunch of random, like, you know, I'm buying, I'm going after these right here. These are a lot of graphics from 99 century marks. I mean, you know, this is, I think Carrie Kittle's like, you know, I was a $25 card or something. So yeah, I mean, it's, I, I do a lot of singles, basically set stuff, you know, unfortunate thing. And I'm the first, you know, we eat our own dog food. Like I'm not going to be able to submit most of these, you know, until our prices come down. I'm not going to spend a hundred bucks or 150 bucks on these um, to get them graded. But so I've got, you should look, I mean, I've got, piles of you know singles waiting you know to be graded one day so you along with many of us are are uh, just anticipating the bulk service to reopen we'll get there yeah we'll we get will. there we'll get there um I, I only have uh i only have two more questions left for you and i'm just trying to decide which one to ask you first i'm mm -hmm. gonna ask you uh this one first do you ever see yourself like do you ever see yourself not collecting? Like I know myself, Nat, I'm a lifer. I never see myself stopping till the day I die. How about yourself? Yeah, I, I can't imagine not collecting. Yeah, can't imagine life without the hobby. No. Mm -mm. Okay. I mean, I've been doing it so long as you have. Like it's just part of my identity at this point. It's impossible it's, it's, to it's in. It's in us. It's part of who we are. Final question. What advice would you give somebody who's coming into the hobby with with a budget of say ten thousand dollars a month, which is a lot of a, it's month? a lot oh, of money yeah. <laughs> for most people? Yeah. And but I want I'm going to ask you that like if you if you ha if you were looking to curate a collection and without knowing what somebody's interests are, how, what sort of advice would you give them at that at that entry point? First of all, that's a lot of money. Um, I would, well, I mean, it depends on your goal. If your goal is to collect things you like, then obviously buy the sets that most appeal to you or cards most appeal to you. I would probably say mix it up and do some investment cards. You know, I'd buy a mid-grade 52 tops mantle after a few months. I'd buy, um, so I'd honestly, I'd buy wax packs. I think these are like the best investment you can make. PSA graded, don't mess around with raw packs, like quick PSA professor. <laughs> public service announcement about pack grading is, you know, about on, on vintage packs, it's like a 90% failure rate, meaning like the packs are searched and failed like 90 plus percent of the time. So buy graded. Mm -hmm. um, I'd probably do that, like pick your favorite sets and buy unopened packs and boxes if you can't find them. Um, but I buy, you know, go for scarcity. It's not, it, it's not rocket science, you know, 
find cards you like that happen to also be scarce. Like PNG Green's a great example. That's pricey, but I mean, now they are. They weren't 10 years ago, but you know, you could, anything scarce that has popularity attached to it is going to be great, you know, financially over time. I think uh, Prism Golds is a good example of that, you know, nowadays in the modern stuff, if you're into that, like the community stuff. Um, it's hard to go wrong with Gold Refractor or anything, Tops Chrome. Um, yeah. Pick something scarce that's also popular that appeals to you. Yeah, no, that, that's pretty pretty good advice. Pretty standard too. It's it's just, it's just logical. And then I'll flip it. What advice would you give someone who's coming to the hobby with a budget of say a hundred dollars a month? Uh, I would try and put together um, uh, a player collection. Like you know, doesn't have to low grade. Like you know, you could pretty much with how many cards we're grading, for example, PSA. I mean, you can find. PSA ones of, you know, cards that you can't imagine why they were even graded, but they have a story attached to them. Uh, I think it's really cool to do that. Like, you know, build a, I'm just making it up like, you know, Jordan cards from the early nineties, you know, you can get those PSA tens for like less than 20, $30 now sometime. Um, so I would, I would do that and maybe pick up some like low, low grade late eighties Jordans. You know, you can get a low grade 88 or 87 clear for, you know, under a hundred bucks for sure. Um, those are, those are iconic cards from the greatest player ever in basketball. I and mean, you're going to do, you'll do just fine, you know, with that strategy. And, and you'll enjoy the cards. I, th I think the lesson there or the takeaway for me is that there are, the hobby is still for everybody. You know, you can still enjoy this hobby. You can still collect uh, a set. You can collect a player with as little as a hundred dollars a month. You can still oh, yeah build a collection over time. So don't be discouraged. You just have to have realistic uh, expectations of the type of cars that you'll be buying. So any final comments or thoughts to you, Nat, again, as you know, speaking to people who are looking at looking to build a collection or, you know, maybe just coming to the hobby or looking to kind of shake up their approach. Uh, the breakers are going to hate this, but I would say if you're on, you know, a budget, don't open packs and do breaks and <laughs> buy singles. You know, if you want cards and you're, you're, buying a lotto ticket every time you open a pack or a box you know your your surefire way to build a portfolio is to buy the cards you want um in the grade you want and i would buy i would say don't mess around with the grading honestly it's a controversial opinion but you know if you're new to the hobby don't get cute and buy raw cards because unless you know what you're doing you know you're going to get you're going to be disappointed when you submit those cards there's a reason most of them aren't graded already yeah um especially the older stuff. Don't mess around with raw packs. Um, don't mess around with boxes that aren't wrapped by BBCE pre-89. Like, you know, be really smart. Don't don't get uh, too cute with your, you know, oh, this is a good deal. It's a, you know, raw Gretzky. <laughs> you know, that's not, you're going to get smoked if that's what you do. So that's what yeah. I would say. If you, haven't, if you haven't looked at 100 raw Gretzkys in the past, you want to be careful if you're going to go out and purchase one i think that's great advice not really uh you know a bit of buyer beware but uh just be careful it, as we spoke to earlier relationships are important and if you have con connections on instagram or wherever you know ask ask those connections for advice most of us in the hobby are more than willing to help others out to make sure that you can sort of minimize your your mistakes and errors uh, along the way. So, all right, Nat, I want to thank you for joining today's collector. Really appreciate your insights. Hope everybody got enjoyed this and uh, can take something great away from this, this show. So again, thanks a lot, Nat. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right, you bet. Thanks again.